Um, so my question is, um, I mean, you talk about um, infrasternal angle. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we, we want it to match with um, infrapubic angle. Um, and that can sometimes flip and, and they can not be uh, matched up. My question is, um, can you see an infrasternal angle can you see a compensation within the rib cage? I guess so. Could you potentially have a wide ISA and like a narrow uh, outlet of the rib cage? Okay, great question. So there's a few different things going on here. So let, let's just make sure we clarify. So I think the the two things that we're looking at, Gabe, with this is you have the structure of the rib cage and pelvis itself on one end, and then the dynamic capabilities of that on the other end. So to your first point, I can have normal breathing mechanics. Let's, let's go with the mechanical aspects first. Should be if I am taking a breath of air in, you're going to see the infrasternal angle widen because that's the bucket handle action of the lower rib cage. So you got, you got to think of it this way. How am I going to pull air in my body? Well, the way I do that is I have to fill the lungs as much as I can, right? So then think about this. If I have to fill the lungs up, what is the diaphragm going to do? It's going to descend. It's going to descend. And so then as the diaphragm descends, what's happening to the, the crap below it, which is the viscera, the guts and the goods? It's going to compress. It's, it's going to, and where's it going to move to? Uh, it'll, inferiorly. It's going to move inferiorly. Yep. So then I got my pelvic floor here. My grandson's going to help us out, Gabe. So the pelvic floor has to make enough space to essentially catch this stuff. And the way that that happens is you can think of like you got this catcher's mitt in your pelvis. It's going to expand outward like this, right? So it's going to get big in all directions. And then the sacrum is actually going to counter nutate to try to accept this downward displacing viscera. So then, Gabe, if the sacrum counter nutates, the infrapubic angle is actually going to narrow. So when I breathe in, the ISA widens, the IPA narrows, and then so Gabe, talk me through exhaling. What's going to happen? Everything's going to reverse. Exactly. So okay, I got to get the air out. How am I going to do that? I'm going to squish the pelvis so the viscera shoots upward. So then the IPA is going to widen, right? Not that much, of course. Viscera comes up diaphragm ascends when the diaphragm ascends the ipa is going to narrow because the lower rib cage has to close so it squeezes the air upward does that make sense yes so normal mechanics would be i have an uh the isa going one direction and the ipa going another direction so in that sense you will have differences in movement capabilities but here's the issue if I have compensatory mechanics at play, which is just about everyone, you'll actually have the same thing going on in both of those respective angles. So for a wide infrasternal angle person who doesn't have dynamic capabilities, essentially what happens is you have the diaphragm descending, the ISA widens, so I get the wide infrasternal angle, but they have a loss of the pelvic dynamics and you have the sacral nutation action going on, which is where the IPA is wider, right? So now I got wide ISA and wide IPA, right? Now with the narrow, diaphragm actually descends even further. It flattens. And when the diaphragm flattens, the, the line of pull that it has on the lower rib cage actually inverts, and that's where you get the narrowing. But I want you to think, Gabe, back to the breathing mechanics that we had previously. If I've really pushed the viscera down, what's going to be the orientation of the pelvis? It's going to uh, remain narrow. So what, what was the orientation I used to catch the downwardly displacing viscera? Wide. Where was it wide? Uh, you lost me. <laughs> so remember the catcher's mitt? Yes. So if I have the viscera going way down, I really need to get in my catcher's mitt position. Wide inlet and uh, narrow outlet. Exactly. 
So then that's where you have the matching ISA IPA. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Now to your next question, can you ever have a wide infrasternal angle and a narrow infrapubic angle? So dynamically, yes, but also structurally, you can have a situation where I have someone who's got a wider rib cage and a narrower pelvis. So think about most of your apex athletes who they got that V shape. That's probably who you're dealing with in that case. That's the structure. So, but what it could be is I might have a compensatory situation where I got that wide ISA person and they still, from a movement perspective, might have a wider infrapubic angle, but the relationship is where the ISA is wider than the IPA. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So I'll give you another example. Have you ever seen someone who they have a super narrow waist, but they have really, really wide hips? So that's basically the same example, but in reverse. So you got someone who's got really narrow infrasternal angle, and the infrapubic angle might be significantly wider in comparison to where you have that A shape. But from a movement perspective and a dynamic perspective, the position is still counter-nutated sacrum, narrow IPA, but the structural shape itself is wider. And so with both of those, you, you might bias certain activities to maximize the dynamics of that structure, but you might take one exercise and it might look different for each of those people depending on shape. Does that answer your question? I think so. I think so. So, well, I heard I think, so what's still not clear? Um, I guess the, the, the maybe a part two to the question would be... Please. Could you could you have a compensation? Um, could you have like two um, maybe different? Um, I don't know the right way of phrasing it, but let's say you have somebody who's like a wide uh, ISA. Okay. Um, could they still have maybe like an an exhaled or like a narrow compensation at the lower rib cage? If I have a wide ISA and an exhaled compensation at the lower rib cage. So the structure itself would still be wide. So the question would be, when you say an exhaled compensation, okay. So that would be someone who maybe movement perspective acts like a narrow? Yes. So what I'm thinking in that case, so if we just take stereotypical wide ISA, they're going to be good at moving the rib cage outward and upward, but they're not going to be good at closing it down and in, right? Because the rib cage is wide. So that particular individual then would have a difficult time also raising the rib cage outward and upward. So basically you have a loss of movement in either direction. Short answer is yes, that can happen. So that would be like, Another example would be if I use the, my elbow as an example, because anytime I can flex my bicep, Gabe, you know I'm going to. I might have someone who can't get full flexion or full extension. So they have a loss of multidirectional restrictions. And, and those, those movements have paired mechanics that go about with um, that. You know, One person might have a bias towards having versus not. You can have the same thing in the lower rib cage where I, I have an individual who can't move in either direction. And so, yes, that, that is very common. You can have those superimposed compensations atop one another. Um, if you run into that, the fix is still the same. You get them to stack. In both situations, you still work on a full exhale first because regardless of ISA presentation, the diaphragm is descended. Um, and, and, and it may be that you just have to do other, other combined movements, whether it's driving rotation or something that gets anterior and posterior movement of the rib cage to improve, and, and you can get some changes with that. 